The historical processing of Cold War nuclear materials at the Savannah River site from the 1950s through the 1960s resulted in chemical and radioactive contaminants seeping into subsurface groundwater on site. SRNS Area Completion Projects is responsible for the remediation and restoration of this contaminated groundwater to its intended beneficial use and the protection of human health and the environment. In the 10 years since SRNS began managing the groundwater cleanup, the widespread implementation of more passive and energy-efficient treatment technologies has increased effectiveness while saving taxpayers millions of dollars. A typical groundwater contamination plume looks like this. The source zone has the highest concentrations of contaminants. As the contamination is dispersed through primary plume and fringe, concentrations generally are reduced. The graded approach to cleanup targets the different concentration zones with specific cleanup strategies. Usually you have a source that requires some sort of very active, very invasive cleanup. And so that's where you have the highest contaminant concentration levels. So you want to get rid of the source first. Over the years, a wide range of source control and removal techniques have been deployed, including excavation, stabilization, capping, dynamic underground stripping, soil vapor extraction, pump and treat, and electrical, chemical, and thermal treatments. And so we tend to go in fairly aggressive initially, and then you can start backing off and going to a lot more passive green remediation type technologies. They're considered green because they have a lower carbon footprint. It's greener because it uses less energy. In some cases, passive means we're getting to the end of uh, cleanup because we're, the levels are so low, it's not efficient to run the active systems anymore. And we've reached that point of diminishing returns with a lot of our systems on the site. We're spending a lot of money on this active system, but we're not really getting any return. In reality, the majority of remediation sites across SRS are winding down. 408 of 515 waste sites are now completed, resulting in an 85% footprint reduction. A lot of our waste units, I believe we have 39, that are using passive systems as a polishing step to clean up the groundwater. So that's good news. Most passive and enhanced passive technologies at SRS are a result of teaming between ACP and Savannah River National Laboratory. SRNL operates the EM Center for Sustainable Groundwater and Soil Solutions which provides technical consultation to Department of Energy sites, as well as private and public organizations across the country. Savannah River site has been on the leading edge of putting passive and semi-passive technologies in place. They've been open to innovation and open to science and been partners in putting that in place. Even active and energy-intensive soil vapor extraction systems where gas phase contaminants are vacuumed and treated above ground, can be converted to greener, more environmentally friendly cleanup systems once contamination levels are reduced. The microblower uses solar power, and so it's the same process, except for the vacuum that's pulling on the vapor out of the subsurface is powered by solar energy versus electrical energy. The batteries actually provide the energy to operate the system and the solar panels charge those batteries. Then as the sun goes down, these things have some longevity into the night. 86 microblowers are in use across SRS, with more on the way. As contaminants become even further reduced, SVE can be scaled to the point of having a zero carbon footprint. So we have a range of technologies that try to take advantage of, of natural conditions and processes. One is a barrel ball, which is simply a check valve that relies on the barometric pressure in the atmosphere moving up and down. And what it does is it vents the contamination out of the subsurface with no active pumping. The barrel ball, which was developed at SRNL, has been privately commercialized for use nationwide. 
Another innovative treatment at SRS, bioremediation, uses soybean oil to replace an SVE and and pump-and-treat system that was costing almost a million dollars a year to operate. The injected oil encourages and accelerates voracious oil and solvent-eating microorganisms in the soil to multiply, consume oxygen, and destroy or detoxify the contaminants. To remediate rad contamination at the same location where a plume of highly acidic, low-level radioactive liquid waste was discharging to surface water, the team researched then deployed a multi-pronged enhanced attenuation remedy. First, underground barriers were installed that funneled the groundwater into subsurface gates. There, an alkaline base solution is injected, effectively stabilizing the waste in a local treatment zone where over time it's absorbed, diluted, and decayed. A third system at the same location injects silver chloride particles to remediate iodine-129. The evapotranspiration from a 60-acre plantation of trees also provides enhanced passive remediation to tritium-contaminated groundwater that leads to streams and the Savannah River. The technology, known as phytoremediation, uses plants to uptake, break down, or manage subsurface contaminants. So the first thing we had to do is we had to stop the migration of the groundwater. And we did that by driving a sheet pile dam that stopped the migration of the plume and forced the plume up. So now we have a pond. A simple above-ground sprinkler system has irrigated over 185 million gallons of tritiated water since 2001. We want to get this water soaked up into the trees, which will eventually release it to the atmosphere. The trees are doing the work for us. And since tritium is a form of hydrogen, it stays with that water, and it gets released and infinitely diluted in the atmosphere. It's way less energy intensive than the alternatives to treating tritium in the groundwater. Then it's something that we kind of use the natural flora and fauna. We reduced our tritium concentrations going to Savannah River by almost 50%. Our new remediation goal now is 70%. Innovative cost-saving technologies aren't confined to the cleanup. Collaborations between ACP and SRNL during the initial contamination characterization help define where the plume is, how big it is, how it's migrating, and what's the best strategy for remediation. Detailed flow and transport modeling is used to forecast how contamination will change with time. Predictive modeling can also be used to compare the effectiveness of various remedial groundwater strategies. Since 2008, more than 60,000 pounds of non-radioactive contaminants have been removed from the groundwater beneath SRS at a cost savings of more than $5 million. Likewise, annual costs to remediate radioactive contaminants in F&H areas have declined from about $12 million to $1 million. One of the changes that DOE has seen over the years is that with negotiations with the regulators, we've been able to go from active treatments to passive treatments. Not so much we're doing less, but we're doing more with less. The continued endorsement and flexibility from state and federal regulators has also encouraged the SRNS team to innovate further and roll out industry-leading technologies. So the fact that we're saving money becomes less important than the fact that the remediation is actually accelerating cleanup and in improving the environment. Potentiometric surfaces in the three major aquifers.